Hello, I'm Pete Sumrall, and did you know that God so loved the world he gave his only son, Jesus, so that we would have the opportunity for eternal life? It is good to know that God, who is so big, loves us who are so small. But what is love? How do we obtain love? Well, today we're going to explore the topic of love during our teaching with Dr. Lester Sumrall. Enjoy today's teaching. One of the greatest gifts God has given man is the ability to love. Throughout time, man has searched for the true meaning of love. This search has left mankind confused and bewildered. 1 John 4, verse 8 says, He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. Dr. Sumrall has prepared this teaching series on love, the greatest power in the world to help man find the perfect love that only God can give. From the love of God the Father to love in the last days, love, the greatest power in the world. It's always interesting to talk about power. And we believe the biggest and greatest power in the world is love. That where force fails, love takes over. But you can do more on the face of this earth through love. Love comes from God. Hate, war, and destruction comes from the devil. So you have to decide which one of these forces you're going to be functioning in. If you're going to be functioning in God power, that's love. If you're going to be for functioning in, in, in demon power, then that's hate, rebellion, and war. No matter how well you justify yourself for hate, rebellion, and war, it originated with the devil. So you're functioning in the wrong source. Uh, we have an exciting lesson uh, today, and uh, we, we just hope that you tremendously enjoy it. Uh, it begins on page 11, and it has to do with the love of God the Father. Uh, we have sought for several lessons now uh, to try to bring into our spirits the rudiments of love, of what we're talking about. Now we wish to talk about love as it is demonstrated in the deity, love that is demonstrated in the Father. And then in our next lesson, love as it is demonstrated in the Son and then love as it is demonstrated in the Holy Ghost. Uh, it is possible, I understand, for a mother to have 13 children and to give every one of them the totality of her love. That every one of them receives the totality of her love. God, God is like that. He can have a, a million beautiful children and he can give each of us the totality of his love. That you do not come up short if someone else is enjoying the love of God. That you can have the fullness of God's love at the same time as someone else is having the fullness of God's love. This means that jealousy has no relationship to the thing we're talking about. The reservoir of love is so big and so full, every human can dive in it, swim in it, and live in it, and have the love of God. Can you say amen? Love has a beginning, and well, maybe it doesn't. Maybe love is so eternal that there are no beginnings, because God is eternal. You only know beginnings and endings uh, as a earth people. Heaven does not know beginnings and endings. It is eternal, and eternal is one of those words like immortality that it defies the human capacity to understand. And so uh, uh, it says here love has a beginning. Well, with you and me it does, but not with God the Father. The Father God, Jehovah, is the total source of love, the first. Love was never known beyond in any form, God the Father. Love 
We cannot say it originated. No, we got ourselves all tangled up, you see, in, in definitions. Uh, love cannot have beginnings. It was in, in God, and God is love, and God has no measurement of time. He is eternal. And so, therefore, from uh, the, the love that we see demonstrated in our lives today originated in God, but God did not originate. God has been there all the time. Love is one of those intimate revelations of the essence of God the Father. We're getting a little better there on that line, I would say. Love is one of those most intimate revelations. It has to be revealed. You do not know this through learning. You do not know it through teaching. You only know this. You only know this by revelation. The world only knows God by revelation. When Peter screamed at the top of his voice, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, the Lord Jesus responded back quickly and said, Flesh and blood did not reveal this unto you. Learning did not reveal this unto you. Uh, you did not, you not find this in school. He says, But my Father which is in heaven revealed this to you. So there, there is information that we have on this earth that is not in textbooks. And no philosopher has ever sat down and, and thought them up, that they come divinely. And love is one of those things. The Father God revealed and demonstrated His love to all mankind. He loves the unlovely. He loves the unlovable. When nobody else can love that one, God can continue to love them. And the demonstration, above all demonstrations, Though there are, there are many demonstrations of God's love in our universe, the greatest of these is that He gave His only begotten Son. That gift reveals His tenderness and His love. In 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11, it says, Finally, brethren, farewell. He says, Be perfect. Be of good comfort. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love, <laughs> his essence is that. And the God, which is love, the very essence of God is love. And the God of love and the God of peace shall be with you. He shall be with you. No doubts about it. This God will never leave. The God of love will never leave, never go away. He will be with us in this world and in the world to come. Your point number one on page 11 says the Father's love is unconditional. All human love is related to certain conditions. And I love you because you love me, and I hate you because you hate me. And, and, and so uh, all human love is related to conditions. We love you conditionally. If you keep treating me right, you keep giving me gifts, I'm going to love you. But if you kick me in the pants a couple of times, I'm not going to love you anymore at all. Are you here? Then love is conditional on how you're being treated. We love when we are similar in likes and dislikes. We like people that are something like us. And we tend to care for those who are like us. So our love is very closely related to what you look like and what you do like. Or if you compliment what I already am, then I can love you. That means if you can give to me strength, if you can give to me stature, if you can compliment me in any way, then I'm going to love you for that. But the divine love, the Father's love, is an unconditional love. There are no conditions for it. There, there, whether you're up or down, tall or slim, it don't make any difference. Uh, God's love is an unconditional love. Whosoever you are, wheresoever you are. And Jesus said those words in John 3, 16, that God so loved the total human race, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. And so it don't matter who you are on the face of this earth, what continent you live on, or what race you might be of, God loved you, you see. And, and that His love is unconditional. It doesn't have to, it doesn't have to meet certain standards. Uh, he just loves you. And that you don't understand. No human understands it. Uh, but God is 
is love. Romans 5 and 8 says, but God commendeth his love toward us, that he, he, uh, he gave his love toward us. He demonstrated his love toward us. He commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, while we were yet in a state of rebellion against heaven and against God, then he still gave Christ to die for us. When we had no, no assets, you know, at all, then he says, well, you don't need any assets. I'll give you my son that he might save you. Ephesians 2 and 4 says, but God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, for his great love wherewith he loved us, I am fully convinced that no human person has ever been able to comprehend the depth of the love of the Almighty God. That, that our, our figment of imagination and our ability to calculate has no potential in reaching into the depths of what we call the love of God. That the love of God is so far beyond human knowledge and human powers of understanding that we just don't know it. For his great love, wherewith he loved us, we are the chief thing of God's love for the simple reason we're made in his likeness and his image. In his likeness and his image. How many believe that? I, most of you won't. Because when I say in his image, that means we're the same size. And that buffalo, some, oh, you can't make God my size. Well, the Bible says you're made in his image, and an image is the thing the same as what it, the replica is. And so we are made in his image and in his likeness. We are, look like God, and we're made in the, we're, we're a little image of, of what God really is like. And so God, especially more than he loves mountains and more than he loves stars and more than he loves flowers, he loves those who are his image and his likeness. He made us, created us that way. Point number two, the love of the Father, God, uh, removes any kind of curse off of us. In Deuteronomy 23 and 5, it says, Nevertheless, Jehovah thy God would not hearken unto Balaam, the false priest that wanted to condemn Israel and curse Israel. But the Jehovah thy God turned a curse into a blessing unto thee because the Jehovah thy God loved thee. And so nobody can curse those that are in love with God. Are you here? Well, you ought to wake up then. I have been cursed by witch doctors all over the world. It's like pouring water on a duck's back. It just rolled off. You say, why couldn't they curse you? Because I've been blessed of the Lord. How can you curse whom God hath not cursed? That's what Balaam said. And it works two ways. How can you bless whom God has not blessed? Some people go around always trying to bless somebody, and God hadn't blessed them. How can you bless them? It is a waste of energy and time for you to try to, to build somebody up that God can't build up. We put money into missionary projects. It's just like pouring water down a hole because God hadn't blessed them. How can you bless them? Oh, I'm going to build them a church. Do they have any, oh, they'll get those saved later. No, they won't. It'll be an empty church. A friend of mine in the Philippines has built five or six hundred churches, and right today there are a hundred of them empty. He built them for people that wasn't worthy of them, and they wouldn't even keep the doors open. Are you here? Okay. In your point number three, man does not merit God's love. You see, you, you do not do something that causes God to love you. God loves you because you are what you are. You're an immortal creature made in his image and his likeness, and he loves you because of that. The ancient book of Job in chapter 7, verse 17 says, What is man that thou shouldest magnify him? Isn't that something? Magnify him. That thou shouldest set thine heart upon him. And, and, and he's, he's talking to the Almighty. And the reason God magnifies us 
as human persons. And the reason that, that God has set his heart upon us, we're made in the image and likeness of God. We're like him. And so he, he's, he gives his love toward us. And if he could teach us to be recipients of that love, I believe that every day of our lives, we could increase our capacity to understand God. I believe that every day of our lives, we could, we, we, we could increase our understanding of the knowledge of love if we set our hearts to it. But our problem that we live in in our modern age is that we give almost all of our time to that which is for a moment, and then it passes away and it's gone, and, and it has no continuing help, no continuing help. And uh, that's the reason that I don't, I don't care for novels, and, and, and I, don't, I don't care for some story that somebody tells, because it doesn't relate to me. I, I love history, and, and I love biographies. I want to know what has happened on planet Earth, and if it's good, make it happen again, and if it's bad, bury the thing, you see? And, and I want to know what we can do to make your living better. Not dream about it, work at it, you see? And, and the thing that burns within my heart, my heart is how can I make this a better community here, with better people here, with happier people here, and people with a future beyond the grave. A future beyond the grave. In our land today, there are many people that think there's nothing but mist beyond the grave. That isn't true. God is beyond that grave. And he's the one that we want to see and want to communicate with and want to live with and want to love for all of eternity. Can you say amen? Now, you cannot merit by your good works the love of God. Every person has directed toward him God's love. And God does it of his own will, his own desires. And, and so you do not merit it. And your point number four God's love is for all times. There are people today that say, well, God did miracles. 2,000 years ago, he, hadn't, he doesn't do miracles today. That would simply mean that God's love used to be, but God's love isn't, you see, because healing is, is love and expression. When, when, when he takes away pain from your body or disease from your body, that's a manifestation of his love for you. And so to say that God used to do things that he doesn't do anymore means that God used to love, but he don't love anymore. Are you here? All right. God's love is for all times. The great psalmist said in Psalm 42, 8, these words, yet the Jehovah will command his loving kindness in the daytime and in the night his song shall be with me and my prayer unto the God of my life. It doesn't matter whether it's daytime or nighttime or springtime or wintertime or summertime. God's love is for all times, good times and bad times. God is with us at all times. You cannot say, well, God's going to be good to me this winter, but man, God help me in the springtime. No, he's a springtime God, and he's a fall God, and he's a winter God, and he's a God for old age. I wish people knew that. When people get around 50, they begin to worry about old age, saying, I'm going to be unloved, and I'm going to be sick, and the devil pats you on the shoulder and says, and I'm going to make it just like you prophesied. <laughs> but God didn't say that. There's no reason why we can't live a good, healthy life until the, the day we go to heaven. And there's no reason why we can't choose the day. It wouldn't be good for some of you. You'd bless everybody out just the day you left, you know. It's a good thing they take you out and you don't know when you're going because you'll be fighting on your way. Just <laughs> God loves at all times. If you know it, say amen. amen. All right, number five, God's love is the best thing in life. Now, if you can't get that inside of you, that a new house is not the best thing in life. It's good, but not the best thing in life. A good job is good, but it's not the best thing in life. A good wife or a good husband or good children are good, but they're not the best thing in life. The best thing in life is the love of God. And for us to be intermersed into it 
and in, into us until it's in us and we're in it going going both directions. In Psalm 63 and 3, it says, because thy loving kindness is better than life. It's better than life. There's nothing associated with life that can come up with the qualities of divine love delivered unto us. My lips shall praise thee, he said. And that's what we should do. We should praise God, not just for breath and not just for our food, but we should praise God for his love wherewith he's loved us. And, and start telling him of all the demonstrations of that love that we have enjoyed and how beautiful it has been, you know, into our innermost being. And in doing that, we draw closer and closer to the love itself. Love begets love, and love flows with love. And the more that we, we express our love toward him, the closer we're getting to the expression of his love toward us. Can you say amen to that? Okay. So God's love is the best thing. There are a lot of things that are good, a lot of things that we enjoy, but above them all, beyond them all, the greatest thing for every human being is the love of the Almighty. The heathen have no such God. The heathen have no such God. <laughs> and most languages of the world, when we, when we start to translate them into another language, the word love, they do not have in their language. So we have to, some way or another, cook up two or three things, smash them together, and create the word love. Because God is not there. And if God is not there, then love is not there. So it's the coming of Christ into the nations of the world that brings the love of God to those people. In point number six, God loves the righteous. Now, 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 now that's, that's not being bad. Uh, God loves righteous people. You say, why? Because they're like he is. They're his little imitators. And so God loves righteous people because he is righteous. And so you're getting to be like God, and he has a very special uh, look at you uh, because you are, you're like him. In the psalm again, in Psalm 146, uh, verse 8, it says, The Lord openeth the eyes of the blind. The Lord raises them that are bowed down. The Lord Jehovah loveth the righteous. He loveth the righteous. You say, but does he love the unrighteous? Yes, but he loves the righteous in another way. He loves the unrighteous and that he wants to make them righteous, but he loves the righteous that they're already inside of him, in God, in Christ. We're inside uh, when we have come to receive uh, his holiness and his righteousness, making us part of the God family, for today are we the sons of God. And it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we shall be like him. So God has a very particular uh, operation and function between those that are righteous, far beyond those that are unrighteous. With the unrighteous, he's offering them love. With the righteous, they already have it. They possess it, and they are in him, part of him. The unrighteous are not in God. Don't ever think that. God has an expression of love in that he'll save them. If they're drowning, you see, uh, he'll, 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 he'll throw them a, a life buoy out there uh, to, to save them. But the one that's already saved, he just hugs him. There's a difference in a drowning man getting uh, a little life raft up there, and there's a difference in the fellow sitting on the raft. Are you here? There's a difference between the sinner and the godly in relationship to the love of God. To the sinner, God is offering it, and to the righteous, he's got it. And that gives them a different relationship with God. So God loves the righteous. The wise man said in Proverbs 15 and 9, the way of the wicked is an abomination unto Jehovah, but he loveth him that followeth after righteousness. So God loves those who follow after righteousness. God's love draws men. In Jeremiah 31, 3, it says, The Lord hath appeared of old unto me, saying, Yet, yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. If today you want to follow Jesus, and today if you want to be like, be like God, it's his loving kindness that's done it. The loving kindness of God. In, manifested in Christ Jesus or manifested in your own life, that love is the drawing force that draws us to Jesus. 
Jehovah God loves givers. In, in 2 Corinthians 9 and 7 says, Every man according as he purposeth, purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for Jehovah loveth a cheerful giver. You say, why? Because it's like him. He, he gives the sunshine. Uh, he gives the rain. Uh, he gives breath. Uh, he just gives. And so Jehovah loves one like himself that gives. Now, the devil keeps everything. He's never been known to give anything except disease away. He's full of sickness, and he gives that to people. But he never gives anything good because he has nothing good to give, and, and God has good things to give. And point number nine, God corrects those he loves. And sometimes uh, we don't understand that, but you should. Uh, you don't correct the neighbor's children. You correct your own children. You see, why? Because you love them. Uh, they belong to you. In, in Hebrews 12 and 6, for whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. Uh, that word chasten is corrects. He, he corrects us. It, it's because he loves us. He don't want to see us go the wrong way. He don't want to see us believe the wrong thing. But he wants us to understand that, that he is the mighty champion and the mighty God that gives strength unto all of us who wish to follow him. And scourgeth every son of whom he receiveth. And this discipline is what makes us love God more. And it's what makes your children love you more. And point number 10, the Father's love is beyond human comprehension. In 1 John 3 and 1, he says, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Uh, therefore, the world knoweth us not. When you get into class, they don't know you, because it knew him not. So what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us. We are privileged to bring you these teachings by Dr. Lester Sumrall. If you found today's teaching valuable to your life, we encourage you to visit our website to obtain an audio or video recording of this inspiring message. Your purchase will not only grant you a copy of today's teaching, but ensure the continued support of LaCie Broadcasting for many more years. I'm Pete Sumrall, and thanks for watching.